Yeah. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> seems like we caught, we we down. It seems like we down a couple of points. That's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So the so the 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 problem is they have all the guns and they have all the money, right? So 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 well, we got the biggest so, penis. Yeah. So so uh, I'll edit so, it out. I'll edit so it out. whatever so whatever whatever we can bring to bear. You know what few tools we have, the powers of the weak, we need to bring to bear, right? Yeah. Um, so, so, so thinking about this um, made me realize we need to start thinking about social systems, and uh, psychology is a good place to start. Okay, write that down. So, so you you probably know that word flow from yeah. psychology, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 cheeks at me higher. The, the 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 positive psychological state of flow yeah man um, i'm with you and and uh he also uh talked a lot about education and the fact that vygotsky when he talks about uh the zone of proximal development he's talking about flow and if you if you look at most of the psychology of uh, learning literature and you look at most of the psychology of flow literature it keeps talking about this as if it's a single static state. And people say, oh, how do I get into flow? How do I get into the zone of proximal learning, right? Um, but when you actually look at the data, what people will say is, nah, not so much. You're really moving between those states. And so you have moments where you're challenging yourself and you're learning new things and you're being tr uh, creative. You're using trial and error experimentation. Right, very very diverse set of of practices and thoughts, and then you have moments where you go, okay, I've nailed it, I got this, but I need to like really get it down, and right. so I need to practice those skills. Right, I can't just move on immediately to this whole new thing, and so if you look at that over time, you've got entropic modulation, and so so just like a healthy uh, 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 biohuman system is going to be modulating. Um, a healthy psychological system will also be modulating in similar kinds of ways, right? Interesting. Um, and that's also true for political systems. So one mm -hmm. of the problems that, that happens with dictatorships is that you have an old boys network. So Putin says, I'm not gonna have elections and risk you know, getting voted out of office. I'm gonna gather together my cronies and I'm going to get this fossilized, encrusted hierarchy put together, right? And so even when somebody gets elected democratically, over time, they can fend off the democratic process and right. turn things into this low entropy, fossilized Interesting. hierarchy. Interesting. So um, uh, Matthew Fletcher, who's, who's both a, uh, a justice in the Native American court system uh, in Native nations in Michigan, as well as a professor of law, University of Michigan. Uh, Matthew's been talking about these traditions in which they use short-term limits um, and other ways to add in a kind of fluctuation. Um, so when I read his paper on that, I said, well, we call that entropy modulation. <laughs> we need you on our team because you yeah. anticipated everything we're talking about, but you've applied it now to the political sphere as well. What's a healthy democracy? You can't okay. have anarchy because that doesn't provide you any structure, but you also can't have a dictatorship where everything is too structured, right? You need, wow. to, be able to, you need to be able to move between moments where there's structuring going on and moments where there's fluidity. So you're telling on. me, you telling me the answer is the American dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not so much. So, so, so the American dream, we have this fetish for the for the innovator, the creative, right? The, yeah. the that that one person who 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 brought together the new new, the new um, new, and and not and not so much that that structure that's going to support people in trying out new, new things. things. Yeah, and, and so be genuine so, about it. Yeah, and so so you have you've always had these econ economists uh, like Schumpeter who coined the term creative destruction, 
Mm. And and Schumpeter said, you know, capitalism should not allow monopolies mm. because it's it's constantly should it should be constantly innovating and overturning, right? And so right. if we're if we're seeing monopolies being formed, that that in in a sense oh. it is destroying okay. the actual good that entrepreneurship could do. And so we need some way of preventing that monopoly formation. Um, so we've we've been talking with folks um, who have been working on what's sometimes called the solidarity economy or the the cooperative solidarity commonwealth about the need on the one hand to allow free enterprise, allow experimentation, allow people to try new things, right? Um, but you want to catch people when they fall. Because if you don't, the only people who are going to be the risk takers are the wealthy. And that's the system we have now. So yeah, we 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 celebrate and we fetishize, you know, the, those wonderful innovators and risk takers. But you look at who those folks are, and they're coming from wealthy families. Okay, let's and they're, pause. They're real quick. coming from that big support system. So let's pause real quick. So let's talk about the people who are privileged enough to get investments in. So typically, do you find those people who are privileged enough to get those investments in that their ideas are less so let, so, uh, recursive and more top down versus the opposite. I would I would say if you want to appeal to investors, you need to appeal to their worst instincts. Okay, so then here's need- my point. This is yeah. my problem with Shark Tank. Okay, so this is my problem with Shark Tank. Majority of people who get money, all right, are people who have proof of concept, right? Because you have proof of concept, you can get the money. You know what I'm saying? That's all great. And unfortunately, whenever whenever there's someone of color. Right. That comes on. If you if you generally someone of color. Right. You know what I'm saying? If you know what I mean, you know, we coming from, you know, we coming with an idea. That's what. Think about it. The idea is going to be based off of what? What do you think? Uh, it's going to it's going to tend to be more supportive of of people and the community and the environment. And do you think those get funding from the sharks? Never. Never. It's, it's 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 upsetting. It's like really upsetting because like, I'm just like, I know where you're coming from with this. I know the purpose behind this, but these capitalists do not care about that. And it's so sad because you see just people with money who are people who spent a lot of money, who went crazy in debt, getting investments for just these not basic um, system. They're innovative, innovative, but they're not recursive at all. And the ones that have ideas that want it to be recursive, they don't get funded because it doesn't get the capitalist money. Or or, or it doesn't maximize profit. It like, doesn't so, scale. So, yeah, it, just, yeah. it can't be scalable. They use that word a lot as all. Well. They're like, I yeah. don't think this could get scalable. It's a great yeah. idea. I don't think you need yeah. a shark though. I'm like, yeah. what, what the hell are you talking about? It's 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 funny because you know I, I I show my students the kind of stuff that we're doing, um, and the first thing the students will say is, "Okay, but how's the scale?" And my my answer to them is always, "Since when did scaling solve our problems?" Right. So so you know you you've got this great new idea, the internal combustion engine. Now you scale it up by a billion cars, and what happens? You've got global pollution. Warming. Pollution. Yeah. Pollution. Yeah. Say it again, yeah. Ron. Say it again, <laughs> Ron. When yeah, does so scaling let's, become let's, the solution? Yeah, it's usually 90% of the time scaling is the biggest problem. Oh my geez. Um, so You're breaking so the code, of, Ron. So so one of the things we've been um promoting is is this phrase uh prefigurative. What's the word? What's and the phrase? Prefigurative. Prefigurative. Pre, like before. Oh, pre. And, and yeah, and 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 figurative, like I want a figure right. of what's going to happen, right? Right. So, so um, if you read uh, Machiavelli, the Prince, yep, he he says the ends justify the means. So, if this is going to get you what you want, you know, just do whatever whatever you have to. Um, and you have folks like Karl Marx who said we need a temporary dictatorship in order to have freedom in the future. But if you look at the history of the Soviet Union, there's nothing temporary about that dictatorship. Right. Right. You had the Bolchevich. You had the yeah, you had the, you yeah, had the, yeah, you yeah. Had the capitalists, but really the Bolcheviks, the Bolcheviks, who were revolutionaries, right? They were yep. 
poor ethnic white men who were trying to go against the capitalistic, like the same stuff that I won't say the Black Panthers, because you know the Black Panthers, because the Linsky and Karl Marx, a lot of their reading the Black Panthers read off of. And so they had a lot of similarities in coming up, but the end result was not what we wanted because then you got Stalin. You know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. And the yeah, Bolsheviks, well, they were even, just yeah. Go yeah, ahead. even even Lenin, Lenin, you know, you you can you can see the foreshadowing of Stalin and 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 Lenin. Um, and even Karl Marx himself, if you read him, he talks a lot about centralization, mm. right? And he and there, he says yeah. you, you you can't trust people, you can't have democracy because they're so clouded, so diluted by capitalism that you can't put them in charge. You have to have the elite, right? The the Politburo, the vanguard, has to be the ones in charge. So oh. so Marx had already eliminated the possibility of a prefigurative approach. He would he would say in order to have freedom you have to take away democracy to begin with, and the minute you do that you're doomed. You know you have these 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 groups that want violent overthrow and you ask them why and they say because we want a a, a future of peace. Right. Yeah, we want a re total reset and then we're going to have a future of peace. But for now we have to have violence, and and you you can't get there from here. You know. So the insight that that Mahatma Gandhi uh, and Martin Luther King and these folks had is that you need a um, a transformation that prefigures the future that you want to have happen, right? Okay. Um, okay. And so, so what we've been trying to do in in Detroit in in our, our our project with this NSF grant is to say, well, how can how can we look at right now the kinds of work that we want to see in the future? Um, so we let me let me get out of my my entropic yeah. modulation. Uh, uh, this is great, here and, this is and really go good. back to uh, good, good. I'm <laughs> I'm enjoying myself too. Yeah, so, this is really good. So so um, going back out now to to thinking about you know how is this going to happen, right? Um, so what we've been doing is is gathering up examples of these heritage algorithms, whether they're the African fractals or the Native American entropic modulation. Um, and then having, we started out just with uh, kids doing these simulations, right? So, so how do you do braiding simu fractals, braiding simulations? Um, what's going on in the heads and the hands and the hearts of the folks who are oh, doing that? And how do we translate that, right, into wow. these computational tools? Right. Um, but then, then bringing that to the adults and saying, okay, so the next generation, these young kids, um, they're doing, they're using simulations of these things from your braiding shop. How can we now bring that value back to you braiders now that we've gotten so much? You know, there's been such such a benefit from what you guys are doing. Um, and Marx was wrong. <laughs> your, your average citizen is not a dumb dumb. They're a visionary, right? They can figure out the future. Um, oh, so so we've been coming up with all kinds of different, you know, digital fabrication tools and such. Um, and they're quite varied uh, depending on who it is you're talking to. So you know, we're working with uh, uh, African American students. Um, they really seem to love the 3D printer. Yeah. Um, Native American students, they really wanted to do handcrafting, um, and so we had them do the virtual designs. But then uh, we mapped that virtual design onto a, a just a board, and they drill holes in where the virtual design says to drill the holes, and then yeah. they they handcraft. So they are the 3D printer. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it kind of makes sense if you think about these histories. So what was taken away from the African American community? It was it was you know, their their freedom and in, in in not having to do all the work, right? So it makes sense that that they would gravitate towards a three D printer that does the labor for you. Yeah. Whereas with Native Americans, what gets taken away from you is that connection to the land and the materials and the handcrafting. And so it makes sense that they would say, no, 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 what I want back is not the printer doing it for me, but the, the ability, the experience, right, to be putting this in, in a futuristic framework. Um, so you, you get very different, you know, oh. sets of priorities, depending on what, what group you're working with. This is actually a group in West Africa that was doing this um, batik stamping with uh, wax. And so they said that they're um, making these things from latex sponge. And once they're worn out, they throw them in the back, but they don't decompose. And so they're piling up, you know, in the garbage. Um, and so they said, do you, can, you, can you make a biodegradable version of this 
for us. And so we um, 3D printed a little mold and then grew fungus inside to create the stamp. So she's holding mm. one of these fungus-based stamps here. And then once that wears out, they can throw it out and it just decays, goes back into the into the Hopefully. soil again. So so every group seemed to have a different, you know, basis for, for doing the kinds of, of invention, innovation uh, that they needed. And so here you can now see that recursive loop, right? That generative cycle between what's what's happening in the classroom, what's happening in the braiding shops, and then that that moment of innovation where you're coming up with, you know, mannequin heads that are based on uh, 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 designs that the kids or the braiders themselves are producing. Um, this is a little company we helped uh, some folks start in Ghana. We shipped these uh, laser cutters to them, and then they worked with um, older folks that had these materials and sewing machines, um, but they didn't have access to you know computers or laser cutters. And so the young ones wanted to get involved with the digital economy, um, but you don't want to pull them apart from the older folks. You want to have that intergenerational collaboration. Um, and so if you go onto this website, AfricanFuturist.org, you can order these shirts uh, that they're making through that collaboration. Um, and they too are, you know, they're doing outreach to the uh, uh, STEM education community. So they've, they've got kind of a, a pro bono community benefit aspect that they're doing there. Um, and this is a little project that, that one of our grad students here at, at University of Michigan came up with. I um, told uh, Kwame Robinson, the grad student, that I was watching tourists in Ghana uh, purchase factory-made cloth, thinking that it was hand-woven, and it's it's illegal. It's smuggled in um, oh, and then wow. sold in the markets as if it was handmade. And tourists don't know the difference. So no I said, way. could you use could you use artificial intelligence to detect the difference between the two? So that was actually our, our cool. first uh, co-authored publication with with Kwame. Um, nice. And then since then, he's he's become the uh, uh, the research uh, student on the the the, the grant, the graduate research assistant. Um, so right right now it only exists on a desktop, but we're trying to get it down to something that could be on a cell phone. Um, and then once we have that, the next step is to see if the AI can identify which village or even which weaver wove that particular design, right? Because what you want to do is not just Think about the point of purchase. That's kind of a capitalist point of view. Yeah, you want to think. You want to think about the relational economy, right? Because one of the one of the things that's destroying biodiversity and destroying the ecosystem right now is fast fashion, mm. right? I mean, back after World War II, we started we started to produce more than we could consume, and so they had to come up with what's a technique where I can dupe people into buying stuff they don't need. And so saying, oh, now the fashion cycle is going to happen every year, right? So every just, fall, yeah. Vision, right? Yeah, so they're just buying clothes that they throw away. Yeah, or, say, or saying, you know, those, those devices are not going out of fashion fast enough. Mm. So we're going to have planned obsolescence. Yeah. We're going to figure out how to build in the obsolescence into the device. Yeah, so you right. Need a new one every so the year, software just right? dies out. Yeah. Oh, my geez. Or, or you had an excuse, you know, oh, you're still using that software. It's no longer compatible with anything on the web. Right. And they just, so, they just lie to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what we want to do is now ask, could you have a relational economy like indigenous folks were originally working on where you actually know the producer, Right. So yeah. maybe 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 you don't need wow. an Apple producing 10 million units that are identical. Um, what you need are a thousand different cell phone, grassroots cell phone groups. They collaborate together so that things are cross-compatible, right? And you could you could even out you think about you know Apple versus versus Android. Um, you could even do away with those kinds of incompatibilities. If you had a community-based economy instead of this proprietary, uh, you know, hoarding and monopolization of things. Interesting, right? because they're always going to want more the next time. Yeah, yeah right. Because yeah. the first iPhone, it was worth probably four hundred, maybe three hundred dollars, maybe maybe probably six hundred dollars. But now this thing is like almost fifteen hundred dollars, like just in the value and what the technology is now. Right, and it's right. every year. People are spending a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars every year. Yeah, yeah, man. So first yeah. off, man, I just want to say thank you so much 
for allowing me to do this podcast with you because this is supposed to be the fourth, fifth time we done canceled on you, man. And I really appreciate you. I'm not, <laughs> I, I, know you I know you're still talking, but I just want to uh, get to like just one last question. And yeah, then I'm gonna let way. you uh, close. All yeah, right. man. Absolutely. So, so Jay Cole said, and I just you know I just love uh, Jermaine Cole. He's a you know very just prominent uh, hip hop artist. Um, excuse me. Let me uh, fix the core recording. So he said there's beauty in the struggle, okay? And essentially it comes from a song called Love Yours. And it's not to glorify being impoverished. He's not saying that. What he's trying to say is that where you come from, like you said, like you said, Karl Marx didn't know that the layman, the normal person have the answers. We have the answers to our to our everyday problems. If we look within it, right? If we recognize the beauty and what we call the struggle, right? Because if you say it's a struggle, that's really just your opinion of how you're feeling, but it's really just your presence and your perspective is you call it a struggle or if it's just at peace. Because you've seen people in probably the worst conditions ever. They're probably the happiest people in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm sure you've yeah. probably experienced that where you Absolutely. can look at your struggle and somebody else's struggle and it's completely relative, right? But the, yeah. if you recognize the beauty in it, then you start to recognize the the just the what's the word, the complexity and the the just the uh, what, what, what I'm trying to say. If you recognize the beauty in something, you treat it as what it is, you respect it, and you start to look at it for uh, for resource. And if you have a problem, you try to go to those resources to get those answers. But if you don't look at those struggles as beautiful. And you have a problem. You're not even going to resort to those as a resource. Yeah, yeah. You're not even going to resort to yourself and where you come from as a resource because you look at yourself as not beautiful, right? And yeah. what your work yeah. does, and what I've always wanted to when I first came to Detroit, was that there is beauty in this city. There is a history in this city. There is a struggle. And you can try to tell me that there's no beauty in it, but there is beauty in this city and that these people who have been surviving over the last 50, 60 years in this city, thriving, allowing the city to still operate, there's beauty in that. Absolutely. So, well, why are we why are we taking these cities like Detroit, Chicago, right? The, 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 the place where the indigenous people are, right? The place where the indigenous people hub. Why are we saying that they are not beautiful, right? Why are we putting them to the side saying they're not worthy when they got the answers, right? So, yeah, how, so yeah. how do we redirect and allow people to see the beauty in the struggle and, and allow us to elevate those people so we can solve these problems? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think Malcolm X had a great point when he said uh, we need to start thinking about the, the commonalities uh, between the struggle that white folks are undergoing yeah. in these low income communities right. and the struggle of black folks. Right. So so uh, you look at one of the reasons why there's so much uh, hate online and why there's this rise of the alt right and, and the neo Nazis, you know, and they're they're tapping into that pain of the past. Right. And saying, well, wait a minute. You know, we've been waiting in line to get ours for multiple generations. Right. And now all these other people are going to step out into the front of the line. No way. I'm not standing for that. And so you've got somebody up here, you know, holding those strings, those strings uh, convincing that uh, it's, it's the classic divide and conquer strategy. Right. Um, so so uh, a, a lot of, uh, of the materials you'll see in our, our website, our education website, um, we talk about things like Appalachian communities where poor white folks were struggling. Yeah. And, and in fact, if you if you go back, uh, look at our, our uh, CSDT, our, our culture situ design tools for quilting, um, you'll see that the information that kids are getting about those Appalachian quilts, um, a lot of those were actually, uh, they're in museums and they were um, raffled off to raise money for the North during the wow. Civil War because wow. the, the, they were called mountain whites back then, right? And the, the mountain whites realized that they had more in common with enslaved black folks than they did the plantation owners. Wow. The, plantation, you know, the plantation owners are the folks that have been sending them off to work and die in the coal camps. Right. right? They, they, they share the same struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even when you when you use that language of indigenous, 
you know, white folks have an indigenous yes, system. Too, they do. They do. Right? You look you look at the Celtic uh, right. tribes in, in Europe, um, and they were colonized by the Roman army and the British army, right? Um, the only difference is that it was cannibalism. So when it, Interesting. When, it came to, when it came to Europe, it was, you know, Europe colonizing itself. Wow. Right? And when it came to the rest of the world, it was Europe colonizing someone else. And we've, we've somehow turned that into a story about uh, Europe not having an indigenous past. Um, but you can look at the same principles of, you know, cooperation and harmony with nature and so on in those European indigenous traditions. And so some of the kids, you know, we, we work with um, really respond to that. And they're like, yeah, I want to find out more about my Celtic past. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and others, others want to find out more about, well, what is that, that history of, of this feared figure of the redneck, you know, <laughs> Is that really always always on the bad guy's side, or no. are we looking at folks who were just put there as you know, yeah. that cannon fodder, right, for the class warfare that was? And going so on. let's talk about it. I mean, because that's the that's literally the conflict between the Ukraine and Russia war, right? You know, like they've been fighting for Ukraine for centuries. You have yeah. ethnic Europeans fighting against other higher class, right? You know, it's 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 all within the same, right? You know, yeah. So. What does war do to biodiversity? And like, is a World War Three? Is that going to be the solution? Or like, like what do you know? Like, what does war do to biodiversity? Right? And just yeah. like, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we not go to war, man? Because we do not need that right now. We have way too many things going on that we do not need another war, man. Yeah. So so uh, you know, certain certain things will add more stability. Uh, to nations and i mean just to um, pause you real quick so like even yeah. like a war like i can imagine that's going to decrease entropy like drastically how do we reset in a way that's you know what i'm saying yeah yeah uh, no you're you're absolutely right and 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 even you know within the u.s when we're not directly at war with somebody we're affected by those wars that either happened in the past or haven't happened yet that we're preparing for Right. So that that yes. prepared that preparedness forces us to take immense amounts of wealth and deliver it to the military so that you, you're constantly in readiness. You're constantly in, in preparedness. Right. What what an immense waste. Oh what what a, just a, a mind blowing decrement uh, to, the, the, to the progress of, of the one race, the human race uh, that that we could we could do without <laughs> for sure. So, so that's a, that's a, that's a really interesting question. You know, I I um it's hard. Was just, yeah. I was just talking the other day to a friend of mine about um, Mussolini in Italy, uh, um, uh, and and the the fact that his his son um, became a jazz musician. Oh wow! And and so interesting. Yeah, yeah, and and so uh, you know Mussolini Benito, the original Mussolini. Um, banned jazz because he was in league with the fascists and he thought, though, well, the last thing on earth, you know, he just invaded Ethiopia. Um, yeah. so the last thing on earth he wanted to do was to show the sophistication of black culture. 